Uh, welcome everyone. Let's do a roll call as we typically do from the right side, from skiers right. <laughs> Puggy Holmgren. Douglas Stevens, Lola. Oh. Randy Scott. John Hutchings. Lola Beetlebrox. There she is, okay. Um, Alan Long. Great. Welcome everyone. Um, have we had a chance to look over the minutes and any edits needed? If not, do I hear a motion? I had no problem with the minutes. I can't move for the 13th because I wasn't here, but I can move for the uh, first. I can second. Oh, this, all right. Yeah, sorry. Oh, we've, got, we've got the, sorry, this is, so this will be for the 1st of March minutes. Let's do them. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the March 1st meeting minutes. I second it. Great. John Hutchings with a motion, Puggy with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, carries. Now for the minutes for the 13th of March. I will also make a motion that we approve the minutes for the meeting on the 13th of March. Second. second. Okay. We've got uh, uh, John Hutchings with a motion, Doug Stevens with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Moving on to public communications. Do we have anyone from the public? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Okay. Great. Then moving to staff and board communications. Staff, any of any communications for the meeting? Um, we can give uh, an update on 1304 Park Avenue that was before the Historic Preservation Board last in November of last year. You've seen on the news. Um, yep. Just to let you know, we're working with the applicant and property owner to um, preserve uh, as much historic preserve as much historic material as possible. Great. Um, so that may be coming before you again in the near future. Okay. Good to know. I walked by it. <clears throat> Is that the one that was yes. crushed? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a mess. That big long flat thing. I don't. I don't remember it having any posts in the back and. Uh -uh. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people listen to KPCW and have called me and said, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, we had some of the same. Um, okay, thanks, Rebecca. Any other communications? I have a couple. Okay, great. So staff is working with IO Landark and Kirk Huffaker to create some illustrations for our historic district design guidelines. And we are holding a stakeholders meeting on Monday the 10th at 1 p.m. just upstairs in the planning office. And the stakeholder meeting is um, comprised of staff, local architects, and we would love to have two volunteers from the HPB uh, participate in that. So if you're available and interested, we would love to have you. Sorry, okay. what was the date again? Uh, that'll be Monday, April 10th. At 1 p.m. I'd like to do it. Doug, okay. I'd like to do it, but I can't. I can Monday's, Monday's my hell day. Okay. I can be there uh, as long as it doesn't snow, but it's supposed to be 50 degrees that day. So <laughs> right. hopefully it's not snowing out. Wonderful. All right, Doug and Lola, I'll put your names down. Yeah, and put me as tentative if you could. Okay. And the location of that meeting is at City Hall, correct? Correct. It'll just be um, upstairs in the planning department. Okay. And then my last item is um, on June 9th, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office and Preservation Utah are collaborating on the annual preservation conference. And if any of the board members are interested in attending, please let us know. We'd be happy to get you registered. We do have uh, Lola registered already and would love to have as much Park City representation as possible. Okay. And that doesn't have to be an immediate thing. <laughs> Just fire off an email or give me a call if you're interested. Okay. <clears throat> June 9th. June 9th. Okay, perfect. Okay, is that it? 
that's it. Okay. And, you know, I've got just one thing to bring um, to the board. So I'm also on the board of the Park City Museum. And every year they do the uh, historic preservation ribbons. You know, yours gets one, yours gets one, yours, actually all of our homes get one. <laughs> um, but we're, we're going into this cusp, and I tossed an email to Gretchen yesterday to see, I'd like to see what staff's thoughts are, or maybe we can think about it as a potential work session, but we're getting into the point of a, the next era, the ski era. And what do we do for the homes that are in the 60s that aren't on the even significant list, there's, uh, there's a list of maybe something like 40 to 50 of those and a third have already been demolished or will be demolished based on what's in planning now. I feel it might be worth a work session to see what, what are we gonna do? You know, the museum wants to recognize them as ski era homes, but um, as you go and potentially put a ribbon on there, you know, you have to really be careful mm -hmm. because it's sometimes recognized as something else. Um, and it'd be great to be in lockstep with the city. <laughs> so I'm just tossing it out there. I'll talk to Gretchen about it, but um, that could be a worthy work to Scott, you know. Yeah, I think there are only one or two A-frames left. Yeah, there's- I did one of them. Yeah, it's still it's standing. The one on Park so, No, the one on Ontario. Well, then the one on Park Avenue is still there too. I yeah. Think. Yeah. But like Chateau Apre is, you know, there's, there are some amazing structures, but also some that aren't so attractive. But still, when you think about the design guidelines back in the day, they have some features that are really interesting. And so I just feel like we should probably look to see, just have a discussion on it. I agree. A little work yeah. session. It's see part of our history. What do we want to do? Yeah. And our future, I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on the agenda then. Uh, unless there's other communications. <clears throat> 40, 445 Park Avenue, looks like uh, we're going to be continuing this, right? Yeah. Sorry, that's correct. <clears throat> and do we need to have a motion to continue that? Yes. Yes, it was noticed uh, for a public hearing. So if you could also open the public hearing and then continue the item, that would be wonderful. Okay, great, so let's do that. Anyone from the public? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Okay, perfect. We'll close the public hearing portion of this. And it looks like we just need a motion from the board uh, to continue. I'll make a motion to continue 445 Park Avenue uh, to the this item to May 3rd of 2023. I second. Okay, Doug Stevens with a motion. Dougie Holmgren with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. <clears throat> now on to our, sorry. Now moving on to the work session, historic district grant program discussion. Thank you. All right, so as you all know, in um, our first meeting in March, we did bring this year's historic district grant program um, applicants to the board for a recommendation and the board selected five of the eight projects to receive financial awards. And last evening at the city council meeting, the council voted to approve the board's recommendation. So all those five projects have uh, received those awards officially now. Uh, during this council meeting, we did get some feedback from um, some of the council members and they had questions regarding the referral of awards over $5,000 to the city council and um, wanted to have a little bit of discussion with the benefit of providing these funds to individual property owners versus to projects that have a broader community benefit. So we can touch on that a little bit later as well. Uh, Rebecca helped me look into the uh, $5,000 um, referral level and we found that although that was never codified it just kind of fell into practice so right now what is codified is awards in excess of $25,000 are referred to City Council um, by the city's standard policy so if the board is interested in possibly getting rid of that $5,000 marker and upping that to $25,000 
Um, staff can do that for the upcoming fiscal year 2024 grant cycle. And that actually coincides very well because awards in excess of $25,000 are also required to provide that facade easement. So those numbers match up nicely. So when we were um, discussing this program with the board, we did get some feedback um, from the board just indicating that maybe it's time to revise the list of eligible or ineligible projects. We have had some questions regarding whether um, paint is an appropriate application or use of these grant fundings. Um, and along with repairing or replacing roofs, if, if that's an appropriate project as well. So if there are items that the board would be interested in adding to the eligible projects list or uh, moving from eligible to ineligible, and we're happy to make those changes before we start to advertise for the next grant cycle. Additionally, um, we have some questions about the evaluation criteria. We have a little bit more um, body in your staff report, but um, just wanted to touch on a few topics here. In the past, there has been an annual theme. Um, I believe in the past, the board has focused on um, garages and outbuildings. In the past, they focused on mining structures specifically. So we just wanted to see if there's a particular um, area or I guess structure that the board would like to focus these grant monies towards and we can advertise that as well. Um, additionally, in prior work sessions, the board had mentioned maybe wanting to prioritize applications from uh, local primary homeowners as opposed to properties that are managed commercially or are uh, not the primary residents. And last but not least, um, we've also had some wonderful suggestions from Doug to maybe consider utilizing these grant funding um, opportunities to offset the costs of preservation best practices instead of standard industry practices. So if someone is coming in to repair a roof, for example, we have the standard industry practice that meets the code. However, if they decide to go above and beyond and do something that is um, uh, gosh, I don't know, <laughs> a, a much more historical um, material on the roof, whether that be a cedar shingle or metal, um, perhaps the board wants to encourage that by offering these funds. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. We have, um, uh, are you up? Sorry, Lola. I, I wanted to know if you had included the original um, worry that I had about the uh, uh, score, scoring, uh, including best practices when best practices were not asked for in the application yes yeah, so that was included in the staff report so we just want to make sure that when we are drafting up that application booklet that we are asking for all of the appropriate materials to help the board make those decisions and it sounds like we do need to beef up the areas where we ask for them to give some uh, much more solid examples of the preservation best practices that they're using in the projects One of the questions that I had about that was was um, if do do uh, the grant the people receiving grants have to go through an HDDR for the their project no matter whether it's painting or what it is they do yes so they would be required to provide a copy of their HDDR waiver letter or their HDDR approval um, final action letter as part of their application. As part of their the application for the grant? Correct, yes. Oh, okay. Was there more, Lola, that you had? Or well, I, I was just thinking that if you 
If you do go through an HDDR, then the question about best practices is, is, is moot because the staff is going to make sure best practices are actually accomplished. But now I'm learning there's a waiver of that. And if there's a waiver of that, then they would have to describe what best practices they're going to um, employ if, if in the grant application. So I think you know, I think it's really important that one issue there was really hard to uh, fairly um, score because some of the grants had excellent uh, detail on that and other grant applicants did not touch it at all. So I think we really need to talk about that along with um, whether or not um, we should also consider um, financial need in as an evaluation criteria. Well, I think just to clarify, you could go through the HDDR process, and I don't believe you'd have to always be using best practices. I think you could use, I think we've got a standard in the community of maybe acceptable practices. And so, which isn't as onerous as best practices. And I think that was part of what the idea was with, I think even when we were discussing this, you know, a few years ago before this got ramped up again was, you know, what kind of tools could we give the planning department as a carrot to, to entice some better practices on, on restoration um, within the construction community and design community. And practices meaning materials also, right? I think materials, yeah, materials yeah. Uh, um, and just the application and the, the craftsmen and how they're applying the materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, I think the easy one is, uh, as she was mentioning, was, you know, certainly an asphalt composition roof was not a, even a historic material, but that's what we put on historic houses around here. So right. but it is an additional cost to do something that might be more historic. Mm -hmm. right. Yep windows, et cetera, windows. doors, mm -hmm. all those kind of things, right? Okay. Um, so for the interest of the, of the workshop, you put some excellent questions there. Should we just work through those questions as a starting point? Just makes sense, right? Uh, yes, these, these questions are here to help guide the conversation or if the board has other items that they'd like to discuss, by all means, this is uh, this is our opportunity to gather feedback from the board to make sure that the grant program is everything that you want it to be. I, I would like to take and maybe start the discussion in a different direction, okay. <laughs> uh, only because it would impact what we're talking about here. I think Puggy will remember from when we were doing this grant program back in the 90s, um, it was an entirely different construction mentality of, of how we were working in this community. The, the inventory that, that had to be restored was, there was a lot more of it. There was a lot more <laughs> issuance of our desire to take, make sure things weren't destroyed, weren't collapsed as we were seeing, you know, this last ski, this last winter season. Um, and the other thing was really quite different too. And I think this is why when I was looking back at the applicants that we've had for the last couple of years, <clears throat> I'm kind of surprised there was not a lot of excitement about what was <laughs> being done and here we are trying to give away money and i was trying to understand why is that mm -hmm. and there's a couple of things that are different from the 90s and i know you will remember this puggy but for a couple of years they did landmark grants which was a fifty thousand dollar grant and they would award it to one project and then they would even do a couple of twenty five thousand dollar grants but you start looking at a fifty thousand dollar grant I mean, that's serious money, but what was even more important back then, that was a $50,000 grant that when you were done with your project, it may have only been a $400,000 home. Mm -hmm. So that was a really significant amount. Yeah. $50,000 on a $2 million restoration is not. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that was really different back in, in the 90s when we started this grant program was we didn't build all winter long it really slowed down. If you weren't closed in by, you know, October. first snowfall, you mm -hmm. were toast for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, you weren't pouring concrete in the middle of winter. You weren't doing a lot of this construction. So 
there was a really big push to get going in the spring and get out of the gate and get working so that you could be closed in and ready and get your project well along the way during the better months. Now that doesn't change. Now they're now it seems like we're starting them and we're building all the time throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, and we weren't, you know, what we're looking for now with our grant program, I think is a lot more is better restoration, not just for, not just saving something. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that and this is so much different than than what we've been doing. I'd like to s explore the possibility of giving the planning department more discretion on giving out grants and using grants as a tool to entice better restoration mm -hmm. or more accurate restoration. We can't do that if we're doing it only once a year. Mm -hmm. um, maybe on larger, if somebody's asking for too much money, maybe they don't feel comfortable doing that or they could bring it to us as a board meeting. But they're also the ones that are in charge of funding and understanding where it's at. I mean, we wrestled a lot with that as we we're going along. But to you know, to have Caitlin come in and have an applicant right in front of right in front of her saying, I want to put on, I want to do a new roof. And she can say, Have you considered this? And mm -hmm. we can help offset some of that cost. Or a front door, as you just mentioned. All you see on the, hardly ever do you see somebody taking the time to pay a craftsman to redo maybe a historic front door. It's like let's toss it out and put in put in a new one. If we and I, so I wonder if we can't, as, with what was being said earlier, if it's below $25,000, and that would fit in within the range they could do that. It doesn't mean that maybe we aren't not part of that process, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a little bit after the fact, or maybe it's, they're bringing it to us for approval. But it'll at least get the needs of when to do this, the opportunity when it's before a planner, again, there's, they're going through preliminary design reviews anyway before that there's time to bring us into the mix and not be trying to shuffle through and measure and and really not get a lot of bang for our, our buck I, um, so it's just a, a maybe a different way to to look this i think caitlin's more qualified than i am on a lot of these things we don't ever have an opportunity to get back to the applicant to say no, why didn't you do this? Right. Um, she's got one it, chance. It, you, yeah, she's going to actually have multiple chance through the planning process because you're going to meet with people through design reviews and preliminary meetings. You know, then there's the whole HDDR process. So there's a long conversation going on there. By the time it gets to a grant program, we've missed a lot of opportunities to kind of up, up this and actually, I think, actually come up with, I think, a, a a better project as far as design and, and maybe elevate what we're expecting as a community for worthwhile design and let the community respond to it and go, hey, that was that was worthwhile of what they're doing. Now it's a little bit like what where did the money go? What did it really do? Yeah. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's a way to even get some marketing off of it throughout the year, even as it's different projects get finished. But somehow it was just not so I, I would love to put that out there and get some people's feedback on this. No, I agree. Maybe not annually, and uh, Caitlin, jump in anytime you want, but maybe quarterly. So then it's not monthly, monthly, but quarterly, every three months, and and notice it to the public. Well, I, I think, I guess in what I'm even thinking is, do we even do a, a an application? I'm actually putting more and more responsibility onto the planners to bring this, if it's less than $25,000, and maybe they're just coming to us to talk to about it, to give her final approval. But, um, well, I, I think they should be required to fill out some paperwork. Because oh, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you on that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's not necessarily a competitive process that's only happening occasionally that we're giving the planning department the tools to take and use. I agree yeah. 100%, I yeah. absolutely agree. And then we maybe, you know, as she's going through this process is they're getting to an approval for an HDDR, which even takes a certain amount of time to do that, that the, they can, it could be coming to us, this application, have us review it and give us her, their, our feedback on it. And that could be done in, I would think, you know, just a 
regular meeting. A regular meeting every, yeah, it takes 15 minutes. And I think the more we see that, the more we're going to be able to fine tune and give Caitlin more kind of direction every month that we get an application before us to go, oh, that lets her communicate to the app, to the, to the applicant. To me, an applicant is somebody that's going to the planning department, looking to pull a permit that has a historic house. That's, that's about all they know. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what the, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think. So I'm, I'm, Go ahead. Lola. So I'm not following this too well um, because I I felt that the group of application applicants that we had just recently was um, a, a very a fine group of applicants that had uh, some really good projects and they. Um, and some needed projects in terms of repairs of some of the, uh, you know, of the facades of the older house. I'm thinking about the one on Prospector, um, my uh, particularly. So I'm not quite sure what the difference is uh, that you're trying to describe, Douglas. Um, how would that? How would this other arrangement differ? from the group that we just um, evaluated? Well, I think what I'm trying to say is I think what it does, it puts more responsibility on to the, to the planning department. In this case, I'm saying mostly the time, Caitlin. She's going to see everything that's coming before them within the historic district. So just by nature, if you're applying for HDDR in the historic district or uh, you automatically become an applicant and eligible for a grant process. You know, we, when I look back in the nineties, I mean, we had so many more applicants and, uh, that I, that we always had to take and it was always a difficult process. And I think the other part of this is we're really looking at in contrast to the nineties, I think we we're looking, trying to save historic properties. I think now based on what we've talked about for the last few years, we're trying to entice, you know, a, a better sense of restoration on these properties. And we, by the time it comes to us, we can't do that. They already have, as you just mentioned, they probably already had their HDDR. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't give Caitlin that opportunity to kind of really, uh, you know, entice them to go a different route. And the other thing too is, really five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars on a million dollar project. And these are kind of subtle nuances that we're asking people to do. Um, yeah, I can see that. I mean, <clears throat> like so the, the grant process is done and so you've got someone that's putting an application now that qualifies and maybe they're looking for five thousand dollars. That's not going to prevent them from moving forward. They're just going to, if the HDDR, by the time they get their permit and it's around grant cycle time, they'll ask for the money, but it won't be game changing. So I, I, yeah. I would agree. I, I, I like that. A lot. I, I, you know, I, we can, and we can, you know, uh, um, once the budget is passed in July, we'll kind of know what we have to work with and we can certainly set aside a value for maybe some bigger projects or something, but then it gives, a, you know, a little bit of a purse that, you know, I can only imagine, I haven't done it, but going through the HDDR process is probably a little bit strenuous on some. <laughs> Having a little bit of good news and potential, here's other ways that where the city's willing to help you. I like that message. I don't know if it's um, onerous, mm -hmm. you know? Well, if it takes another staff member to, I don't, I wouldn't think so, but I think it gives you a little bit of a toolbox to help pull people in the right direction mm -hmm. toward preservation. I, I, yeah. I like that. I think if we uh, make planning, uh, well aware of our intentions when somebody's coming in and wants to redo a certain part of their house and planning can also mention well have you considered the railing and you may be able to get a grant uh, mm -hmm. if you apply if they know the latitude of what we're willing to do and 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 because you know if a homeowner is going to do some work they might as well do a lot of work at that point and and, and get more done and if they knew that we might be willing to help them with that, they might be more willing to take on some more historic restoration elements of their project. 
I'm going to add one more thing to this mix too, because when it's going through the HDDR process, I mean, we have to look at how this whole thing evolves. And during that process, most like you're most likely dealing with a homeowner and or architect in that process. We don't have the contractor involved yet at that point, typically. Typically, it, no. And and. The homeowner architect, or I think, are much more going to be visual about how this is going to add to the house. And I think John Allen just brought up a good point, and that is this could be as simple as about the railing on the front porch. It could be the front door. It could be a prominent front window. Then it becomes part of the plans. It becomes part of the HDDR approval. The contractor is not coming in saying, well, my finished carpenter doesn't know how to do this kind of thing. I mean, they're resistant to that. They don't say that, but they're resistant to it because that's not the practice they've been using all the time, but this does let you really zero in on some very specific things on a project, tweak it, get it involved when everybody's excited about the project before winter has started and there's 10 feet of snow outside. But but there is, it, I think it just makes a more fluid design process. It keeps on more of a micro level mm -hmm. of what to do. Um, and so, with that in mind, I've mentioned the planning department a lot in this. And so is uh, Rebecca representing planning department? I mean, are, is this something that's onerous on, on your end and on Caitlin's end? Or what do you? Well, and I was thinking through the weekly design review team meetings where we have the historic preservation consultants. Um, that could be another opportunity to bring awareness to best mm -hmm. practices that may be heightened beyond what's required in code. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, just based on experience, there's not many different architects that we have coming to these meetings. So I think just with a conversation with a few of them, knowing this is available, we can really help. Yeah, it just kind of makes, it does make yeah, a lot of sense. sense. Yeah. So from what it sounds like, um, instead of staff doing an analysis of the applications, bringing it to the board for a recommendation to council, the board is leaning more towards staff reviewing the applications and then making a recommendation to the board for final approval. Is that correct? And and do and would we have that opportunity with regards if it's less twenty five thousand dollars or less? Mm -hmm. And do we so it's not, that keeps it within the purview, but. And if somebody wanted to do that, we would it would still come to us. We would go through it, but then it would still need to go to city council for twenty five thousand dollars or more. Correct. Right. Okay. And I, my thought is, I think we would all like to see all of this, and it can fit in this whole process with you as you're bringing it to us. It could, we could you could bring it to us before the HDDR HDDR is approved with us going through it, this grant, and just say this grant will be approved subject to the approval of the HGDR with these, as you've outlined it. So we, it would be, I think it'd be really important not to have a whole nother step in this process for the applicant that would delay it at all. Mm -hmm. It just needs to be part of that whole process of getting the permit. What? Like in September, an agenda might be, okay, there's, there's two, there's two applicants in front of us. Here's the, here's the summary and what does the board think about it and move it forward, right? And, and if we're looking at every one of them, especially for a certain amount of time, each, each meeting, it starts to really create a dialogue going back and forth on a current basis, not just once a year mm -hmm. that gives feedback back to everyone about what this what this committee is going to find this commission is going to find acceptable and what we're really trying to push i think okay. yeah i especially like more than once a year yeah yeah so with that in mind are there particular projects that the board would want staff to focus on more when looking for grant opportunities i was thinking about that and i i just um as, as it relates to maybe themes like you had mentioned, right? <clears throat> and I think the theme is preservation, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't want one applicant to kind of be put at a lower priority because we're focusing on windows or railings or something. I, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's just it. Maybe the theme is, you know, to improve the quality of restoration. 
yeah that's the message we to want raise to awareness. Get, raise awareness of it yeah. and, Well, I, I also think the uh, Friends of Ski Mining Historic Preservation, I never get their name correct, um, all of all of their projects, I think, are, are super worthy of, of us backing. So for sure, I think if we if we reach out to them, uh, I, I, I think it's a good way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were significant beneficiaries of this last grant. They were uh, process. I know one of your questions was around um, ownership versus non ownership. And that just seems to me like that's a rabbit hole we can't go down. I don't know how you enforce it afterwards. If we're really making decisions based on ownership, then even in, <clears throat> in the best of intentions, somebody moves for some reason afterwards. Is there some reason? If the way we handled that before was with a, uh, I think it was over a five-year grant process, it was almost like an investment tax credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but that only worked on needed to happen on larger grants. So maybe when we get the twenty-five thousand dollar grant, then we it doesn't become ownership. But if they sell the property within five years, a certain percentage is returned every year, and that's just done through it. It was a trustee, if I remember right, and mm -hmm. Mark could tell us that. Yep, we um, the the trust deeds and the trustee notes and the preservation agreements are an ongoing um, tool that we utilize for all of our grant <clears throat> recipients. Should we review the eligible ineligible list and give some? Yeah, I think this is the one that that can create some some gray area but as we think about maybe this new this new approach <clears throat> having the planning department you know understand what we're looking for here as well might be might be helpful so i'd like to think that the the electrical basically the mechanical systems up, update and upgrading um, I think as far as these community dollars are being spent and the nature of our remodels that were that on a lot of these are being done, unless it's emergency repair type of thing because the heating's gone out and so there's a water issue or freezing pipe issue, which I think comes under not maybe the grant program, but comes under the emergency repair program. But I think to the extent we could have these this money be able to be seen from the street mm -hmm. is yeah. got to be priority. Yeah, above the foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, above the foundation. primary and secondary. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and I, and it keeps it really simple. I think mm -hmm. it keeps that really simpler then too. Yeah, right. agreed. It's, yeah. So, are we um, striking mechanical systems from the eligible projects list? I feel like if I somebody's would. living in one of these homes, that's eligible for the grant. They've purchased it. They can afford it. Mm -hmm. You walk in the door, you know you're going to have to do, do some work. Mm -hmm. And there are times, you know, and I'm speaking from experience, there are times, yeah, it's tough, but I wouldn't have been living in that house. And exterior painting, that that's a hard one for me. If you can't afford to paint your house, yep. find a place yep. else to live. All right. Yeah, I think are we in agreement, especially regarding mechanical systems? Let's take that to ineligible. Yep. I think and if it does fail, it becomes it if it's gonna be a damaging the historic structure because loss of heat and there's a water issue, free, pi, freezing pipe issue, then it becomes an emergency repair issue. Yep. Which is outside of this process. Yep. And I agree with Peggy. I think painting the exterior is um <clears throat> Would you put roofs in that same category? It's like you got to maintain your roof. I think part of the thing with roof is is what Douglas brought up is, and this is going to happen to me in a, in a couple of years. I had an emergency, so I put an asphalt, green asphalt roof on my house. I'm going to, I'm going to correct that probably not this spring and summer, but next spring and summer. 
and put the shakes that were on there originally. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's in a, yeah, that's fair. And that's that, it. you know, and I, I for once, thank you, <laughs> I can afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not applying for a grant, but I think that's where a roof would be considered if they were taking it back to the historic roof. Yeah, yeah. or even siding. You know, I know you can't yeah. create historic siding, but there's that, you, you, you know, that, that standard, you know, yeah, uh, novelty drop siding, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I named it right, but to take it back to that versus I see some with T111 on the front or something like this, you know. So I guess we could reword that, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think insofar as making things inel ineligible, uh, one size doesn't fit all. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think we want to be as open to particular projects as possible. For instance, mm -hmm. Let's say there's somebody who is financially strapped. They have a really significant historic house in a high profile area. They can't afford to paint it. It's deteriorating. And we say we're not doing any exterior painting. Do we want to really put ourselves in the position where we can't do things in the future uh, versus being as open to the projects as possible? Um, maybe one of the restorations of one of the mining projects on the mountain uh, that the friends of the ski history mining people are trying to renovate needs to be heated so that the public could come and visit it. And it, if we say we're going to prohibit heating systems, then does that mean it doesn't give us the latitude to help them heat it so that the public can come visit their wonderful restoration? That's why I wonder if it's really not a matter of looking at each project and dissecting them for a whole bunch of factors and, and considerations, many of which Lola mentioned, I think do need to be taken in consideration, along with how visible are they, you know, how many people are going by them every day. Um, so I think there's so many different factors we have to take in that I don't think we'll ever get a one size fits all. And I don't want us to back ourselves into a point of not being able to help somebody when we think it'd be a good thing to help them because we've decided it's ineligible. I wouldn't disagree with you on that, but it would, we do need to be really, I think, clear with the community about having, having them have some direction on when it might be appropriate. Um, it would need to impact the community. That yeah. upgrade would need to impact the community. Yeah, we don't want to be telling them no. Yeah when if they've thought mechanical systems were might be acceptable and so there'd have to be some pretty clear indications on when that might be acceptable uh, mm -hmm. i think we want to be saying yes more than we say no and not have them confused in their application process so not a not a bad point at all alan it's just i'm not sure how you would word that at this point the other thing that I'm worried about is, okay, so let's say uh, you um, have something in, in, you know, Caitlin comes to us with a project that, um, and let's say in August or September, and so we say, oh, that's fantastic, and you say you can do this if you get an extra 25000 or that's that's really wonderful. And then somebody comes the next month, the same thing happens. And then this next month, so that you following me that uh, all the mm -hmm. money, one uh, of the RDAs is gone. And uh, by, by, let's say Christmas, and then you've got a, a few more months and another project comes up and there's no more money left. So I'm a little worried about the fact that in this past um go around we were able to apportion the money uh because we knew we had a, a you know a, a a a bunch of projects that we could compare and contrast and apportion the money but as you go along and you're giving out money you don't know know what's in the future yeah we could probably limit it ourselves to a quarterly value or or you know half you know whatever the pot of um resources are we could split it in half and have it six well, months at a time or something yeah or maybe the other part of that when as part of the staff report 
when the money, when let's say we have an applicant before us for a grant that's been brought to us one or two at a meeting, that would be a perfect time to also just have a running tally of where we're at on the budget and the different funds, how this is coming out of it. So we're all part of that process throughout the year and, and can be concerned and be aware of another set of eyes. We're not putting the full responsibility of the budgeting process onto Caitlin and the planning department, but we can also be smize on it too. Mm -hmm. Hopefully with it, if we can get enough visual impact out of this and community impact out of this, I would hope that we could take and, and start to receive a larger allocation for, for funding because mm -hmm. people are going to start to see this is almost like the next generation of, if you will, of restoration in Park City. You know, it, it, it's yeah. really about time even. We're not necessarily seeing it. We're seeing really good stable buildings that are being built. We're seeing really nice additions being done to buildings that are that work with, doesn't make it look like the house is just being overwhelmed by an addition. But as far as the detail on the restorations, I'm not sure how much we're really seeing that as a community value that we, I think Randy brought up a good point, that is our community value right now, or the president, the board's value is you know, a, a, a new level of restoration. Well, I, I'm certainly willing to try this approach. Um, I don't see any uh, reason not to try this approach. Um, and we'd have to work out things as we got, went along. But Caitlin, how do you feel about trying this approach? I'm happy to give it a shot. Uh, we in the planning department are already there processing the applications and I'm already writing the staff reports to bring it to the board, so I'm I'm happy to take on take on the efforts. Does this tool help, or is it? I think it would help. Um, often, when we are sitting down with applicants, we hear several quasi complaints mm -hmm. about the design guidelines and how much extra work they're having to go through for this process. Mm -hmm. So, having that additional incentive. I think would be helpful. I think that's what we were hearing from your predecessors mm -hmm. too. Maybe I'm not thinking about this right, but I think consistent with Lola's concern, it seems to me we do need some sort of six month or quarterly budget. And I'm just thinking if we didn't have something like that, would we get into a position where, and it could even still happen, but where we're for where we, I don't know, we've eaten, let's just say 90% of the budget and applicant, applicant comes before us and we like it, it's fine, but you know, we, we're sitting here like we only have 10% of the budget left and we've got nine months of the year. So we're gonna say no to that applicant just because we wanna save some money for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Just wouldn't, if I, if I said that, Correctly. No, I, th I think that's that's always been the hardest issue. Yeah. Is there's too many applicants, not enough money, and and I think maybe one of the ways to be looking at this is maybe it really is becomes we're not trying to look to fund an entire project anymore. We're really trying to to add some visual some dollars that you see from the street, uh, or as you're skiing past it <laughs> somewhere. Uh, and so I think it really has to be just a budgeting process. And that's why I think whenever we see, see an, appl an application before us for a grant, we've got to know what the budget is. And I think we're, that's where I think we've become the constraint on, on that process. Mm -hmm. uh, like this last application process, there were some of those, you know, that we even gave dollars to, but we really wanted to see kind of a line item. Yeah and say, I, I, yep, let's help with this line and let's help with this line. We don't, you know, we don't know what value those are or anything. And it might be interesting, we don't really know yet, but I can see a process going through the design review with Caitlin is she can see where this, this she might be getting a little bit of resistance on the railing, for example, or a front, do front door. And this is where she can come in and be really specific with yeah. it and say, well, if you do this and this, we can help through the grant process might only be five thousand dollars but that's enough during that phase of the process when you're not looking at the entire house mm 
to go, yeah, that's worth it. Let's, let's do that. Um, to me, that's the primary advantage of this approach is, yeah, it was like you said at the beginning is working with the app. I mean, I remember when I went through mine and working with, if I'm trying, I think her name was Anya. Was it Anya? Yeah. yeah. On, yeah, was yeah. yeah. Anya. Working with her. And that was a big, we didn't ultimately take a grant. We were awarded one, but that was a big thing for us was, you know, what can we get money for? And we tailored our project and worked with her to get as much money as we could when we we're going through the design phase. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I, that resonates with me. So should we look um, as we consider uh, moving forward with this, should we look at kind of whatever that value is once the budget is approved uh, for next year, have a six month value? So we have something for the next six? Is that the guidance we give or? I'm, I'm not sure we quite need that yet. I think what we need to do is get, I think I'll, we're going to be reevaluating every time we get an application in front of us. I bet you what's going to happen is, we're going to be pushing back against somebody who's coming in for a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. only so much you can get out of a lot. I mean, right. for somebody to repair the front windows instead of just putting in new pillow windows, it's a certain sum of money and it's not tens of thousands of dollars. It's, you know, for two windows, it might. Yeah. So they're going to be framing for it already. This is just the repair of them or, or the front door, for example, restoring a front door and having a carpenter do that or, um, the railings, things, the front yeah. porches, things are really quite visible. Yeah. Um, I know. I, I don't think yeah. we have all the answers now, but I think we can take and I think we're going to be resistant to somebody coming in and going, okay, we have a hundred thousand dollar budget for the year and going, and they want 50,000 of it. I don't see this board doing that. Yeah. Uh, so I think just again, for more clarity, let's just talk about uh, windows, right? Someone's, uh, remodeling their home instead of getting, um, I mean, ideally if they would get historic wood windows um, around the entire home, maybe that's something we can't fund, but certainly we could on the primary and secondary facade, that's something we could look to and then they could do Pella in the back or something. Yeah, right? exactly. That's exactly. Kind of what you're thinking. There, right? And there's also the trim around the windows in the front. Almost yeah. always what you're seeing is you're seeing a one by four trim being put around a home. Um, well, they're not, it's not one by four, it's one by three and a half. It's actually three quarters by three and a half, which is smaller than what was there yeah. originally. So it's just the difference between buying a one by six and having to cut it down or getting a piece milled up that was really a true one by four, yeah. which you might have seen then. So mm -hmm. the same with the sales and, and some of the tr detail around it. So it's just a little bit more work, a little bit, but maybe kind of a bigger difference about mm -hmm what it's presenting. Mm -hmm. And then that, those dollars can go further. They're, yes. Right. Okay. I, I think it kind of helps us evolve this whole process yeah. between ourselves, the planning department, the applicants kind of it's, it's more organic because we're doing it, you know, maybe every month or every two months or something instead of, this frenzy where once a year we're coming together and trying to figure this out and, and, and we're really not even seeing all the applicants. And when you think about how many applicants have been in that didn't apply for a grant mm -hmm. going through this process. Um, yeah, I like it. And if the board would like a little bit more time to figure out what this new system would look like, you could perhaps in this next cycle do a six month grant cycle that is administered by the board while we set up the, staff administered cycle and maybe do a, a quarterly after that. When, there are lots of options. My suggestion might be is this is why, because we are involved, you know, we're really asking you to look at this a little bit differently. Maybe we could t spend a little bit of time on this in another meeting and see, see how this, you know, how this might function between everyone. When people what, come in for the design review, are they aware of a grant system? Sometimes they are. Um, the typical homeowner is um, just coming in to get a smaller project finished. However, sometimes when there are larger renovations, the applicant is already aware that there is a grant program and they ask about it up front if this is work that may be qualified for a grant award. 
Perhaps uh, this eligible list, um, we could flesh it out a little bit more in each category and give examples of things we think are um, excellent restoration versus not, uh, you, you know, just normal restoration type of things. You know, it's so that people get an idea yeah. of the uh, quality uh, that we're looking for in each category. Yeah, that's absolutely something that we can incorporate into the application packets. It's a great idea. Well, you know, for instance, I can tell you that Silver Star would not have been able to afford or undertaking the restoration of the uh, Colvin and the Hopper if it wasn't for the fact that they were able to receive a grant. So it kind of makes, it can make projects happen if people are aware of it that may not be already happening you know i i wonder if we don't maybe proactively reach out to some of these structures that need renovation to the homeowners or to whoever owns it and let them know that you know we've got dollars available if they'd like to move ahead with the restoration um we would have a silver star would have restored those structures way earlier had had we have known th those funds existed I was actually thinking about it on the way up here, using some emergency funds for snow removal. <laughs> Honestly, like there's another one on Park Avenue that we all visited that has, you can tell that that front porch roof is just hanging on and, you know, and no, no, no. There's My that. neighbors on the one side, he, he said he hasn't seen that. He hadn't seen natural light in weeks because the metal so roof, high, yeah. the snow just kept blocking his windows. Wow. But on the eligible and ineligible, when I was reading through this, it, and it, if it began with an R, I was for it. If it didn't, then I think you should eliminate it. <laughs> repair, repoint, repair, reconstruct, restore. Mm -hmm. Keep them. Oh, I like it. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> The rule of the R's. I like it. All right. What else? What else do we have for input for Caitlin here? Let's see. So looking at these slides, um, we're not going to consider ownership. Um, just discuss the offsetting of costs between preservation best practices and standard industry practices. Mm -hmm. uh, the annual theme is uh, um, preservation. Period. So yeah. I think we've got some good direction there. Um, one of the items that the council member brought up yesterday um, was, is there a, a preference or I guess more consideration given to projects that have a broader community impact versus projects that are impacting the, the property owner most specifically. Um, I don't know if the board has any in, input on that. If well, were the, what were some examples they were uh, giving? Because um, broader community benefit, we, we selected and gave the, um, the, the mining projects uh, more money this past cycle and that has a broad community benefit but and we're we're talking about oh let's make sure that what we're funding is um, in the in the viewpoint from the road which mm -hmm. is a community benefit it's mm -hmm. also an individual property benefit so were there other um examples that they gave is uh you you really hit the nail on the head lola so the examples used were um, for mining structures that although they are on private lands they are um, publicly accessible and um private homes especially along park avenue and main street however again like you said we have 
hundreds of thousands of visitors every year that come up and down our local old town streets, as well as going past the mining structures. So um, the board could argue that there is a broad community benefit to both types of projects. Yep, I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. All right, so we've talked about themes in future grant cycles, um, eligible and ineligible projects, and the evaluation criteria. Um, what are the board's thoughts about the creation and maintenance of a grant recipient database? So with that, we would um, keep data with the address, the work done, the amount awarded, and hopefully some interior and exterior photographs. and. One of the benefits of this type of database would be that we could host it online and it could be viewed um, publicly. People could come in and research various specific um, projects. If they are looking to do a grant application of their own, they can see prior examples. Um, additionally, if we wanted to create a walking tour, for example, of projects that the um, grant program has helped fund, we could do that as well. Um, I believe the State Historic Preservation Office has uh, um, certified local government grants that are available. Mm -hmm. And currently, we would be able to utilize grant funding to print brochures or print maps for this kind of walking tour. So just a, a little bit of food for thought, if that's something that the board would be in support of. I love it. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what you were talking about, but I think that's a really good idea as far as, you know, it really starts to put some information together with what where this money's going um, and how it's benefit. The museum used to do walking tours, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They still do. Yep. Cool. I think I think we would have to disclose to everybody that we're keeping this database and or giving them the opportunity to opt out. Um, yeah. I, I think the only thing I would probably add to that, Alan, is I, we shouldn't be keeping a database of photographs inside of a home because we're not seeing that money anyway. Yep. So exterior photos only? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Something yeah. somebody can say through a walking tour anyway. That makes it's, sense. Alan does break up a, or bring up a good point so that we'll, we will disclose that um, during the initial application process so that they're fully aware of that requirement or of that um, that gathering or that use of that data mm -hmm. and um, would have to agree to it in order to um, yeah, proceed. Right. Yeah, and regarding interior photographs, our multiple listing services are now requiring that if we take an interior photograph and it shows a piece of art on the wall, we need to blur that piece of art because we don't have the right to that piece of art to reproduce it in that photograph so oh, you, we, have, we have to be careful yeah that's a new one that's a new wow one. that's very interesting yeah <laughs> i don't know but Roomba, the vacuum that bounces around the walls evidently is in trouble because they're sending pictures of the interior of the homes to somebody yeah. Jeez. Um, additional submittal items. I don't have anything. Did did was there something behind that a question or? Uh, no, just just a, a question to see if there were any items that the board had noticed during the last review cycle that um, were missing that may have been more helpful in helping mm. make those decisions. But I think expanding on the um, the narrative and the line item requirements will probably clear a lot of that up. I would agree. Yeah. And I think we've we've touched on the priority projects and the ownership priorities already. So yeah, that that really does it for the questions that we um, brought to you this evening. So yeah. if you have items beyond this, we're happy to take those as well. No, I, I think that recommendation is awesome. That, as long, I mean, I'd love planning's uh, <laughs> departments to gel on this, um, but it feels like it becomes more of a conversation and application than something very specific. 
as opposed to, I don't know. I think there's opportunity here. I hope there's opportunity here. So I think there is. I think it's going to be a kinder, more gentle. <laughs> yeah, and very, and very, very specific, you know. So great. Um, would you like us to look into the setup of this new system and come back for a, a future work session or discussion? That'd be helpful at all. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And maybe just even a a quick rough draft of what it might look like. You okay. Know, I don't think we need to hammer out everything all at once, but if we could just get some feedback after you have some time to think about it and see how it might work and maybe things that we didn't think about, um, just keep it moving along smoothly. All Great. right. So then I think we're good, right? That's that's all we've got for you this evening. Okay. So next step. Move to adjourn. Great. Okay. All right. Huggy with the motion. John with the second. All in favor? Aye. Adjourning. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, we need this. good to see you. Thanks a lot. Bye, Alan. Happy spring, everybody. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Bye-bye. You're optimistic, Lola. <laughs> <laughs>